people. Um, we will also make our slides available after the after the webinar. So thank you again for joining us. Give a very brief agenda for the day. Um, first, I'm going to um, hand it over to the executive director of uh, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, MAPC, Mark Drazen, for um, a welcome to all of you in the audience. I will give a brief presentation of our Homes for Profit research um, with um, a little bit of time for clarifying questions on the research itself. And then we are going to welcome our panel, um, which we're very excited to hear from all our panelists today about this issue of speculation and investment in Greater Boston's housing market. Um, and then we'll we'll open in it up for audience questions. We are going to take all questions via the chat, so you won't be able to unmute yourselves, but please do uh, pose your questions, clarifying questions on the research and any questions for the panelists in the chat. And with that, I am going to um, pass the baton to Mark Drayson, our executive director. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jesse, thank you very much. And it is a, a pleasure to welcome you all to this really important unveiling of our research. We have been doing this research. Jesse has been spearheading this work since 2019, slightly before the pandemic struck. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say we probably would have concluded it a little bit sooner had it not been for the pandemic, but Jesse and her team were deeply committed to getting it finished as soon as we could and providing the information and the policy recommendations to all of you. Uh, you know, I have been working in the planning field, but most particularly in the housing field for what is now an entire career of over four decades. And we have always known and seen the advantages of investment in the housing stock and the disadvantages and negative impacts which occur when that investment is uncontrolled and unregulated. I know that most people expect that a certain amount of housing is going to be purchased for investment at any given point in time. But I think most people, including yours truly, were surprised to see that over one fifth of all of the purchases in the period covered by this study were investment purchases. We were surprised to see how many of them were cash purchases. And we were even surprised to see how many of these were flipped in less than two years, particularly in lower income communities and communities of color. And I think it's very important to remember that the ability of investors to control a large portion of this marketplace in part stems from the fact that we have such an incredibly constrained supply of housing. The high value of housing treated as a commodity in a period of shortage attracts investors to the housing market in a way that is not always in the best interests of those homes, the people who live there, and their renters. And a lot of the money that is being made through this process stems from the fact that we have a shortage of housing that has occurred in large part because of government action, public action taken at the federal, state, and particularly local level to intentionally constrain the development of housing and the development of affordable housing. I think we need to keep all of these factors in mind as we learn from this research. And most importantly, as we use it to schedule the agenda for additional research and further study, and most importantly, for the development and enactment of policy recommendations to address the serious impacts that we see in the housing market as a result of not a healthy amount of investment purchases, but a somewhat untrammeled amount of investment purchases, displacement resulting from much of that, and rapid flipping of projects, of properties. 
I do want to thank you all for coming. We have over 150 people in the audience at this webinar. I want to thank Jesse and Alexa DeRosa and other members of our team for the tremendous amount of work that they have put in to uh, completing this study and making the recommendations. Uh, and I want to thank also elected officials and appointed officials who have joined us today and who will be the people we count upon to enact some of the policy recommendations and funding priorities that we talk about in this report. Unfortunately, the number of people makes it a little difficult for me to actually find who those elected officials are, but I do want to thank them for coming and we may acknowledge them a little bit later in the program. With that, I am going to thank you again and turn it over to Jesse Partridge Guerrero. Jesse. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Jesse Partridge Guerrero. I am the um, interim director of data services at MAPC, and I'm so, so excited to share this research that we've been working on for years um, with you all. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Um, again, this is Homes for Profit, Speculation and Investment in Greater Boston. Also wanna very quickly um, acknowledge, thank you, Mark, for, for um, the acknowledgement to me and Alexa. Alexa has been working hard in the year that she's been with MAPC. This has been her main project. Um, it's really exciting for us to get this out. And yet it's been so many other people who've contributed to this work and to getting this um, webinar ready for today, um, including some very uh, key former colleagues who contributed to the research, um, some of whom I hope make it to, I think I saw some names in the in the um, participants list, but I want to acknowledge um, Saliki Flingai, Taylor Perez, Sarah Philbrick, all former um, analysts and interns on our team who um, contributed to the conceptualization of this research and the development of methods. And of course, our uh, former very own Tim Reardon, our um, recent former director of data services who we're excited to have on our panel representing the state perspective. Um, so I can't uh, take the time to list everyone because we'd be here all day, but just so much thanks to everyone on the team who has made this possible. Before I dive into the data, I do wanna ground the conversation today in um, the impact of um, this, our findings on families and households in the region. I'm sure most of you on the call have been following the GLOBE Spotlight series on the housing crisis. And this story in particular resonated with us as we were reviewing our findings, uh, the story of a family, multi-generational family, um, the elder of whom was able to purchase a two-family household decades ago um, that has allowed sh her and her family to have sort of stable housing and the ability to build some wealth over generations. And the fact that the younger um, generations of the family are not able to purchase a house in the same way, especially a multifamily, um, two-family or three-family. And that really is going to show up in the findings of our research. We also know there's there's a, an incredible impact on tenants in some cases when investors buy uh, their properties. We have worked with our um, friends at City Life Vita Urbana, Community um, Action Agency of Somerville and Lynn United to understand some of the stories of tenants they work with who've experienced investors buying the, the properties that they rent and then either it, right off the bat serving a notice to quit to uh, vacate the building or raising rents um, so astronomically that families would have no chance of staying in their homes. Thankfully, through the work of tenant organizers like City Life, CAST, and Lynn United, um, they are in many cases able to negotiate with the landlord for more reasonable rent increases so that families can stay. Um, but in a lot of cases, they're not able to do so. And we know that um, these tenant organizers can only reach so many households and so many buildings. Um, so we wanna acknowledge and keep in mind the tenants and prospective home homeowners um, in the region as we, as we share our findings today. Um, so 
Our, our major headline, as Mark said, from 2004 to 2018, one in five transactions were purchased by an investor in Greater Boston. Um, and we want to share a little bit about our uh, definitions and methods. So um, all the data for this research comes from transaction level data from the Warren Group. Um, and we've defined investors a few different ways. Um, one, any, any LLC buyer, regardless of the number of properties they've purchased or um, the total value of those purchases. We've also defined count investors, um, defined as buyers who purchase three or more residential properties in any five-year um, window over our study period. And I should say our study period um, spans from 2000 to 2022. Uh, we've also defined value investors, which is any buyer whose total purchase dollar amount totaled three and a half million or more over the full 23 year period. And uh, finally, building investors, which is any buyer of an apartment building with four or more units, um, which we assume folks are not buying to, to um, live in themselves. And we derived at these definitions through the literature and also uh, through conversation with housing advocates. Um, and folks working in the housing industry um, in the region. We also categorized investors by size. I'm not going to go into the details here, but um, our category categories, which will come up later in this in the slides, range from institutional buyers, which are very large portfolio, high cost um, investors, all the way down to small investors, which may have only three three properties over a five year period, et cetera. So um, one initial takeaway, we looked at the data um, over time to see how trends in investment have been changing over our study period. Um, we also looked them across different building types. So two major um, sort of takeaways from this chart here, which shows the share of transactions that were bought by investors across um, the period from 2004 to 2018. We see uh, a huge increase in the amount of investor activity right during the um, 2008 recession um, and the housing crash of that period. And then that rate has stayed pretty steady. Um, the rate is especially high uh, for two family and three family properties, which are in this royal blue and dark blue. And then condos in green um, and single families in light blue are lower, but still higher than they were pre-recession. And um, should note that single families and condos make up about 87% of all transactions. So they are the large majority of, of properties that are sold, which is why this um, sort of all residential types in dotted line here is, is uh, closer to those trends. We were also interested, um, Oh, and just on, on the, the high rate it, uh, in two and three families, we see that a third of properties um, that are two family properties are bought by investors and, and half of all properties that are three family properties um, going to investors. So thinking back to that spotlight story about why it's so hard to buy, buy houses like that, um, in addition to all the other reasons our market is constrained. Um, but we were curious um, sort of what the impact of, of foreclosures was on these trends. So um, we looked at the trends removing foreclosures from the data. And what we see um, was pretty interesting, which has been across all building types, there's been this steady increase in investment activity post-recession. Um, and so this gives us a clue that investors really saw that recession period and the low cost properties they could um, get during that period as a chance to enter the market and perhaps build their portfolios. Um, and this trend has just um, gotten bigger and bigger with time. We also see in the data that investors are more likely to purchase with cash, which might not be surprising to folks, um, but the rate was pretty surprising to us. So half of all condos purchased by an investor um, are purchased with cash. Um, and, you know, 40 to 45 percent in single two and three family homes. Um, and those rates are in blue compared to non-investors who are paying with cash um, with much lower rates of cash purchases across all building types. 
We also see that investors that, um, or anyone who buys with cash does so as a, at a discount. So the, the blue line here is the median sale price for properties purchased with cash. Um, and the gray line is, is the median sales price for those purchased with a mortgage. And you can see there's a $100,000 or more difference in those median sale prices um, since the 2008 recession. Now, there could be different reasons for this. One reason that we've talked about is that folks buying with cash might be buying distressed properties that meet, need renovations before they can be, you know, pass an inspection or be lived in. Um, but we also know that cash offers are most attractive to um, sellers, especially sellers who are looking to um, sell their properties quickly, which they can do with cash and not have to wait for a buyer to get approved for a mortgage. Um, they can also often um, not have an inspection when you're buying with cash, which you can't get away with with a mortgage. Um, so it's probably a mix of all of those reasons. Spatially, we looked at the data at the census tract level, and we see that investor purchases are most prevalent in neighborhoods of color. So if you're familiar with the geography of the region, um, you can see the highest rates of investor activity in dark blue in areas of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Lynn, Chelsea, Framingham. Outside of the MAPC re region, we see this in uh, Lawrence, Lowell, Brockton, et cetera. Um, and I should note all of the numbers that I'm talking about today um, from our research are summarized to the MAPC region, which is the 101 cities that cities and towns that make up Greater Boston. But we do have the data statewide, um, and you'll be able to see statewide data on our website, um, which we'll share shortly. So another way to look at the spatial distribution of investment is through our MAPC's housing submarkets. And I'm going to take a minute just to explain what these submarkets are. So we developed these housing submarket typologies a few years ago um, in order to understand sort of the, the similarities and differences of different you know, neighborhoods in the region in terms of their housing characteristics. So we basically um, did a cluster or latent profile analysis on um, at the tract level using different data to to um, represent housing characteristics in the region. And we the result was these seven submarkets, which we've ordered in um, order of decreasing density. So submarket one is the most housing dense subregion, and submarket seven is the is the least dense. Um, so I'll go through briefly each of these submarkets. I've also included just for um, context the uh, racial and ethnic and immigrant demographics of these submarkets. So of the people who are living in the submarkets, um, each of these pie charts on the submarkets um, represent on the left, the share of residents in the subregion who are black indigenous people of color and um, the share who are immigrants. So submarket one is our most dense, highest density urban neighborhoods with high housing prices you can see this magenta color on the map in downtown Boston, parts of Cambridge, parts of Brookline. Um, and you can see about a third of residents living in submarket one are people of color and about a quarter are immigrants. Submarket two is um, also very high density urban neighborhoods with lower housing prices. You can see this light green color here, um, areas of Roxbury, areas of Dorchester, um, downtown Lynn, uh, Lower Framingham, um, a lot of the a lot of the areas we saw pop out in the map above. Um, importantly, in submarket two, this is this submarket has our highest share of uh, residents of color in the region of our seven submarkets at two thirds of residents, and uh, thirty five percent of residents in submarket two are immigrants as well. Submarket three is our moderate density urban neighborhoods. This is really characterized by our three family and triple decker properties in the region. Um, you can see uh, most of Dorchester, areas of summer, most of Somerville, um, Watertown, et cetera, in the region. Um, and almost half of residents here are folks of color and um, a little bit over a quarter are immigrants. 
And then on the next slide, I have our more suburban submarkets. Um, so submarket four still has some moderate sort of mix of, of urban and suburban, um, but lower housing prices. You can see lower shares of residents of color and immigrant residents. Submarket five is our highest cost, most exclusive suburban neighborhoods. So areas of Brookline, uh, Newton, Lexington, Wellesley, et cetera. Um, again, lower shares of residents of color and immigrants. And then similar for submarket six, mixed housing prices, lower density, lowest density submarket seven with moderate housing prices. Um, and the lowest share of residents of color and immigrants. So when we look at those, um, our investor data summarized to our submarkets, we see here submarket two, which again is our um, high density, lower cost submarket where lots of residents of color and immigrants live, has the highest rate of investor activity at nearly a third um, of the seven submarkets. We also see our three. Um, Urban submarkets have higher rates of investment generally than our uh, more suburban submarkets in the region. We also looked at flipping. So um, we defined a property flip as any property that is resold within two years of its initial purchase. We saw 9% of sales in the region were flipped, um, ranging from 8 to 12%, depending on the building size with condos and single families being on the lower end of that at eight and 9% and um, three families and um, apartment buildings with four or more units on the higher side at 11 and 12% um, flipped. We see that uh, investors are much more likely to flip properties than non-investors. So non-investors do flip properties we see in the data um, and we've represented them here in this gray color. Um, but investors, and in particular um, institutional and um, large investors in purple and dark blue, um, are most likely to flip their properties. And um, interestingly, investors, those institutional and large investors, are most likely to flip single family and two, two family properties. Um, spatially, we saw a fairly uh, even distribution of flipping across the region in our submarkets. And interestingly, the highest rate of flipping was in submarket five, which is our very expensive suburban neighborhoods. Um, we found this pretty interesting and have some thoughts of why this might be, um, but um, more to look into there. Um, but with that said, the rate of flipping in submarket five is 10%. It's 9% in our um, submarket two and 8% in, in the others. So a fairly small uh, gap in the rate. We um, looked at the um, initial purchase price of flipped properties and see here that properties that are going to become flipped are purchased um, at a lower price than properties that are um, not gonna be flipped that are gonna be you know, held on or lived in for more than two years. Um, and you can see a, quite a big gap in the median sale price between flips in blue and non-flips in gray. And then importantly, um, when the property is flipped, um, we see that the resale price um, tends to be higher across the board for flip properties, not surprisingly. Um, but we see that investors, uh, sorry, non-investors here in gray, um, resell those properties for maybe 20% or lower, um, higher than they purchased the, uh, the property for originally. Whereas institutional investors here in purple, and then all other investors, small, medium, and large investors in blue, um, resell their properties for significantly higher um, dollar values up to 60, 60 to 80 percent more than they purchased the property for. Now some of this can be that they're putting significant renovations into the property, but our guess is that that's true in some cases but not true in all cases. Um, so I'm going to pause on just some key conclusions before um, introducing our panel and uh, well before then talking about our recommendations importantly. Um, but just to, to recap, 
investors are taking up more and more room in our housing market in greater Boston, making it hard for anyone else to compete um, for housing um, home ownership opportunities. Lower cost urban markets with our largest share of immigrant and BIPOC populations experience the highest rates of investor activity. Um, we see investors come with the advantage of cash and likely pay less because of it. We see that flips occur at similar rates across all markets, but are most common in our high cost suburban markets. And um, investors resell their flip properties for more, significantly more than non-investors. So with that, I wanna share the recommendations we have coming out of this work with a lot of um, thanks to our government affairs and housing teams for helping us pull these um, recommendations together. Uh, we've grouped our recommendations into three categories. First is discouraging speculation, um, including a tenant right of first refusal, sometimes known as TOPA, with a local option. Um, to make sure that when a, a building owner is going to put their property up for sale, that tenants have the right to um, try to compete for a, an offer um, and, um, and also have the right to, to hand that um, right to purchase over to a nonprofit housing developer like a CDC or a community land trust, which can then own the property and make it affordable for the current tenants and in per perpetuity. Um, importantly, we know that financial support is needed for especially tenants and also nonprofit housing developers to be able to compete with the cash rich investors. Um, we're also recommending rent stabilization. Uh, as we see um, from those stories of tenants experiencing astronomical rent increases that um, there is instability experienced um, by tenants when investors purchase their homes. And so um, one, we, uh, we suggest that rents should be regulated to a reasonable increase in rent that um, households can afford so they can stay, to, stay in their homes and not be displaced. Um, but importantly, that regulation needs to hold across ownership so that when a new owner buys a a property, they can't just immediately increase the rents. Um, we're also recommending transaction transparency, really just to make it possible for us to understand who is behind LLCs, because we know that, um, you know, one or two people um, can be, uh, you know, the major stakeholders in numerous LLCs, and often um, investors buy a property under a unique LLC named for that property. So it's it's really hard to get a picture of who the actors actually are um, for researchers, for tenant organizers, and for housing advocates. Our second category is generating resources. So um, transfer fees we think are really critical. Really excited to see that in the Affordable Homes Act um, from Governor Healy. And um, we think it's really um, a key opportunity to capture some revenue from the speculation in the market so that we can afford to build new affordable housing um, in, the, in the state. We also do think this can help in um, discouraging speculation, especially flipping, because it will make flipping a property over a short period of time just more expensive. And it may sort of like eat away at the margins of the larger investor portfolios. We're also recommending an increase to our statewide deeds excise tax, which would apply to all properties, um, but is low compared to other states. And we have, a, uh, finally, a number of, of recommendations to improve um, stability for our um, lower and moderate income home, homeowners and our renters in the region, including emergency rental assistance in RAFT, longer term um, rental assistance through our voucher program, um, you know, improved first time home buyer assistance. We have some great programs out there, but folks need more to be able to compete. And then of course, foreclosure protection. So those properties, one, uh, a homeowner doesn't lose their home and two, so those properties don't have the opportunity to be turned over to an investor. We have another recommendation actually that in the case of foreclosures, um, we'd love to see sort of an option for nonprofit home um, uh, organizations to be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, 
own those properties rather than them going to investors. So there are a couple more uh, recommendations in the report. With that, I hope um, after the panel, you will take a chance to explore our website, homesforprofit.mapc.org. We'll share this again in the chat later, um, but it has our full report, including all of the um, trends I've shared just now and more. Um, it also has a, a beautiful interactive map where you can explore down to the tract level, all of these trends um, in your neighborhoods. So thank you. I think we probably have a few minutes for um, any clarifying questions on the research. And if we can't get to all of them, I don't. I can't see the chat right now, so I don't know how many there are. But if we can't get to all of them, I will um, try to answer them in the chat. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks, Jesse. It looks like Mark has his hand up, so I'll let yeah. him go. And Jesse, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to ask a question. But I, I did want to note that we have four members of the general court who have joined us here uh, today, and I want to really thank them for coming. Uh, Senator Sumaran, of course, from Falmouth is with us. Also, um, my good friend for many years, Senator Pat Jalen from Somerville is here. Also, we have uh, Representative Steve Owens from Watertown and Representative Rita Mendez from uh, Brockton. Uh, I believe I also saw that uh, City Councilor Liz Breeden uh, from the Boston City Council, who represents the Alston Brighton neighborhood, has also joined us for this presentation. I know that there are many staff from legislator, city councilor, and mayor offices, more numerous than I can answer, but we really do thank you all as well for joining us. Thank you. I turn it back to you, Jesse. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you to all of those um, elected officials who've joined us. Really excited to have you here. Um, so there are a few questions I'm seeing from the chat, a question around um, uh, identifying foreign foreign buyers in the market. That is not something we looked at. Um, it is possible um, to ascertain um, where in particular LLCs are located. Um, and in some cases, um, you know, non-LLC investors, um, it's not something we looked at. It's, it's harder with LLCs just because um, there's not great LLC data, which is why we're recommending for transparency on those, but um, certainly something that could be looked at. Um, another question, why, were, uh, why did we define flips as two years instead of one? Um, yeah, so our, our estimate, and this was based on conversations with, with other housing folks, just that in some cases, uh, people may buy a property and then, you know, do a major re rehabilitation, which could take more than a year. So we figured that two-year window, we didn't want to go too far out because we know some people like buy a property as a starter home. And then when they grow their family or for other reasons might want to buy a larger home. Um, but we felt that two-year two, two, win two year window was the right um, sort of sweet spot. Um are investors in, uh, investing in housing stock or in land? Um, that's a good question. These are all residential uh, transactions. So there could be some land in there, but by and large, we're talking about homes. Um, and you know, one, one area of activity that we're uh, interested in learning more about is sort of the teardown um, phenomenon, which might be driving some of those high flip rates in our higher cost submarkets. Um, but that's not something we had the chance to look at now. Uh, another question, aren't homeowners profiting when they sell? Uh, yes, certainly, certainly. So definitely um, building wealth in some cases, if an, a homeowner has, has uh, owned the home for a long time, like a lot of wealth, um, you know, which is wonderful for them and their families, but it also means that high price is not gonna allow any new New homeowners, prospective home buyers, or lower moderate homeowners um, to enter the market in the ways that they once could in our region. I think that's all the time we have, but please um, continue to ask clarifying questions on the research. I will try to answer them in the chat. And um, now I am really excited um, to introduce our panel um, and moderator for the day. 
Um, so I'd like to give them a warm welcome and a very brief introduction to each of our panelists and our moderator. Um, starting with Angie Liu. Uh, Angie is executive director of the Asian Community Development Corporation, and she's a member of MAPC's executive committee on our council. Angie has been um, the um, in the affordable housing and community development field since 2004. She previously served as Asian CDC's Director of Real Estate, overseeing the asset management of their portfolio of more than 300 units, and was responsible for developing a pipeline of new projects for ACDC. Um, really excited to have you. Thank you. Um, welcome, Angie. Um, Katie McCann is Rent Control Campaign Organizer at City Life Vida Urbana which is a grassroots housing justice organization in Boston committed to fighting the racial, social, economic, and gender justice, um, sorry, fighting for racial, social, economic, and gender justice by building working class power to affect systemic change and transform society. They do so through organizing against no fault evictions, large rent increases, and foreclosures in working class communities of color. Katie was previously City Life Vita Urbana's lead community organizer in Malden, Medford, and Everett. Welcome, Katie. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Brian Ahn is Assistant Professor of Public Policy and Finance and the Director of Master of Science in Public Policy Program at Georgia, Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology's Social uh, School of Public Policy. Um, he is also an adjunct pro assistant professor in Georgia Tech School of City and Regional Planning and the faculty lead for Georgia Tech Center for Urban Research. Dr. Ahn's research examines how institutional and policy design affect management processes and policy outcomes at all levels from local and regional organizations to national governments across the globe. His policy research areas span housing, energy, and environment and the role of AI and technology. Um, thank you so much for joining us and welcome Brian. Tim Reardon is the first chief of data and research at the newly formed Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities or HLC. His role at HLC is to support informed policymaking and effective operations by collecting and presenting information to, pre to provide insight into the state of ho the housing market and housing needs in Massachusetts. Um, through development of evidence-based policy solutions, establishment of housing goals and tracking of their progress, and supporting the use of technology to better serve households and housing providers. Prior to joining HLC, as many of you will know, uh, Tim worked for 20 years at MAPC, most recently as our Director of Data Services and my boss. Um, so welcome back, Tim. It's great to have you on the panel today, um, representing the state. And um, last but not least, our wonderful moderator for today is Andrea Harris-Long, MAPC's Manager of Housing and Neighborhood Development and the coordinator for our Technical Assistance Program. Situated within MAPC's Land Use Department, Andrea manages a team of housing planners and workers um, and works with communities across the region on a wide range of housing uh, planning and policy work, including zoning updates, housing production plans, and local housing policy. She's deeply involved in providing technical support on the 3A MBT, MBTA Communities Act um, to municipalities in the region. Andrea has been with MEPC since 2021. So thank you so much for Andrea uh, for moderating. And with that, I'm really excited for this conversation and we'll turn it over to Andrea and our panelists. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jesse mentioned, I'm Andrea Harris-Long, the manager of MAPC's Housing and Neighborhood Development Division. And I'm really pleased to be with you all. Um, it's really exciting to have this re research released today. And I'm really pleased to be moderating a, such a fantastic panel. Um, you all have such interesting perspectives to really share how speculation is impacting our communities, our regions, and the Commonwealth. So thank you all again for being here. And with that, we're going to dive right into questions because I know you all have a lot of really cool things to say about this. So uh, we'll start by kind of hearing from you all and hearing how this research intersects and informs your work. Uh, we'll start with Angie, if you can introduce yourself, and we want to hear, again, how these research findings are intersecting with your work and anything uh, that stood out. So take it away, Angie. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to MAPC for conducting this important study and having me join this panel. 
So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with my organization, the Asian Community Development Corporation is a 36-year-old community development corporation that originated in Boston's Chinatown, which is a neighborhood that had lost a lot of our housing stock from 1950s to 1970s on, first via highway expansion um, and then institutional expansion. So in more recent years, Chinatown um, has now been dealing a lot with gentrification and displacement um, due to a lot of uh, flipping of row houses um, and smaller buildings by investors, as well as um, construction of um, a lot of large luxury housing developments. Um, a lot of the small row houses had also been converted um, to Airbnbs for a while, um, and then to uh, higher rent apartments uh, that are rented to um, many grad students from nearby um, uh, the Tufts campus um, and just higher paying renters. So over the years, we have also expanded our work to Malden and Quincy as we see more low income Asian Americans um, who can no longer to afford to stay in Chinatown. Um, but interestingly, they are also facing similar issues now um, as previously seen in Chinatown. So it's interesting to see the data about um, the submarkets in the nearby suburbs. So our organization uses a comprehensive community development strategy um, by investing in the people um, as well as the place uh, they live. And we also have a placekeeping program that connects the people to the place. Uh, we use art and public space activation to empower residents so that they can feel a sense of ownership and belong in their own community. So some of you may have read um, in recent years that many Chinatowns across the US are shrinking. And this is not because they are losing population, but this is actually due to gentrification and displacement. So Boston's Chinatown faces a um, similar challenge. Um, and although, our organization, um, a big part of our work is building new affordable housing. Um, the pace of our construction can't catch up to the pace of displacement and gentrification. And it is very difficult to preserve Chinatown when we continue to lose privately owned buildings to investors and speculators. Um, it is not surprising to me to see in this new report that one in five residential properties in Greater Boston um, were sold to an investor, as this confirms what we have seen in Chinatown on an anecdotal basis over the last decade or more. And due to our neighborhood's location being in close proximity to downtown and financial district, the properties here are seen as prime real estate and properties are often listed for their potential redevelopment value, which are often well over the existing zoning and height limits. Thanks, Angie. I think that's a great um, grounding and speculation and how it impacts communities and shifts communities over time. Uh, Katie, let's go to you and hear about your work with City Life Vita Urbana. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Katie. I am the rent control campaign organizer at City Life Beta Urbana, and the research confirms what we're seeing on the ground at City Life for years with speculative investors buying up and displacing working class people of color in our communities. Working class renters in communities of color are most harmed by this speculative investment that uproots and displaces communities with a cascade of negative consequences. We are seeing mass displacement by investors of working class communities of color in Boston and across the state. And this, and most of this displacement happens at the point of sale. Earlier this year, the Globe reported that over 100,000 people have moved out of Massachusetts since early 2020, many of them um, from Boston neighborhoods. A research report by City Life and MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning found 70% of market rate eviction filings are in census tracts where the majority of residents are people of color, even though only about half of the city's rental housing is in these areas. In, and this is in many of the same neighborhoods um, that MFPC's report um, shows the most investor activity. 
Um, the damage of speculation by investors in Boston's working class, BIPOC, and immigrant communities can't be solved only by building more housing. While we need more truly affordable housing, since investors can buy our homes and displaced communities, we're calling on our legislators to immediately enact strong protections, including rent control, just cause protections, and Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act to prevent even more displacement from our city and state. We're currently working with tenant associations across the state in places such as Mattapan, Arlington, Lawrence, Ayer, and beyond, where families are actively resisting displacement by investors and fighting for social ownership to get buildings out of the speculative market. And I'll talk about some successful examples a little bit later. One current example um, is the Fairlawn Tenants Association in Mattapan, made, made up of many long-term residents who have lived in the community for 40 to 50 years, who are fighting large rent increases and no-fault evictions by corporate investor DSF. Recently, DSF listed the complex for sale again. Both Rent Control and the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act would stabilize tenants at Fairlawn and in communities across the state by preventing displacement and making it possible to take buildings out of the speculative market. Thanks, Katie. It's really interesting to hear the tenant perspective and the work that's already being done to address this. And nice to see the research confirming your on the field work. Uh, Brian, let's hear from you next. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the report has been really well executed and well done. Um, the, the analysis, I found them really rigorous and really um, um, well presented and executed. Um, Usually, Boston metropolitan area is not doesn't really uh, no, um, is not really listed in one of the hot one of the hottest markets for corporate investors because um, you know if you think about the traditional definition of corporate investors or mega or institutional investors like who own more than hundred or one thousand properties nationwide like invitation homes, American homes for rent, you know they are not really I guess I'm not present um, or do not have strong presence in the Boston metropolitan area. But, um, you know, the market is, has a lot more smaller scale corporate investors. And you can you can really know unless you collect the data. And, you know, those definitions needs to be really tailored to local conditions. And I think this report um, has, has done that very well. Um, I live in Atlanta, and Atlanta Metro is number one ground zero for corporate investment activities. And as of today, at least one one out of um, three properties, only single family renters, are owned by these big corporate corporations and investment firms. Um, my research, which has been published in the Journal of Planning, Education, and Planning Educational Research um, has uncovered that, you know, even though they could be, they, their presence could be small in percentage or numbers, if you look at the neighborhood, just as the analysis is done for some market areas in Boston metropolitan area, it could be highly concentrated in certain neighborhoods, especially in where, where there are majority um, people of color. And when that happens, they effectively suppress home ownership. Um, and my research, which examined Atlanta Metro from 2007 to 2006, over 800 neighborhoods, has found that, you know, corporate investment, especially the larger ones, they explain on average 25% of decreased home ownership metropolitan-wide. And if we look at black home ownership, it explains 75% of the decrease home ownership in the metro over the 10 year period. So I think there are a lot more to examine um, going forward, you know, building on this report. You know, what would be the you know, increased rental burden in these some market areas, some market number two, number three, et cetera. And I think this is a really lot of efforts um, and I'm looking forward to um, further discussions um, during the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to underscore, I think that important point of homeownership is already very unattainable in our region. And this is just further exacerbating that. And I think that's something as the housing planners and team, uh, we think about a lot is that access to homeownership piece. So thank you. Uh, Tim, turn to you. 
Great. Um, thanks, Andrea. Um, so this, you know, this intersects in my, with my work in, in that it was my work uh, until a few months ago when I left MAPC and came over here to HLC, um, where, you know, I'm now the, the chief of data and research, um, you know, and and HLC, you know, formerly the Department of Housing and Community Development was elevated to a cabinet level agency by Governor Healy um, in June of this year, reflecting her recognition that, um, you know, the housing crisis is one of the, um, you know, one of the most significant issues that is perpetuating inequity in our state um, and threatening our long term economic prosperity and well-being of our communities. And so bringing it up to the cabinet level agency and really tackling these issues um, is, is so critical to her. And I think, you know, some of the key priorities that we're working on and that are already evident, um, reducing cost burden and housing insecurity for, um, for renters, um, uh, creating home ownership opportunities, in particular home, owner, home ownership opportunities for um, first time home buyers and uh, home buyers of color. Um, and then enhancing the vitality um, of our city and town centers um, in order to, you know, advance economic development and more sustainable transportation. All of those goals and strategies are threatened by un and uh, a totally unconstrained um, and runaway uh, role of, um, of corporate investors in the real estate market. Um, and so I think, you know, for us, this is a really... Um, important piece of research as we're, you know, developing new policies um, and working to refine the existing programs um, that HLC is running. And I will say as the chief of data and research, I think it also is a good, you know, when I look at all of the questions that are in the chat, which are all very excellent questions that I had to hesitate from responding because it's not my report anymore, it's MAPCs. But I guess what I'll just say to close is like, you know, this, I, I want to, I would like to find opportunities to partner with uh, more organizations to dive into these questions and to hear from community-based organizations, um, from advocates, from researchers, what are the things that we ought to be looking at at HLC? What's the kind of information that's needed um, in order to create better visibility into, um, into the housing situation in the state? And so, you know, I see this as, you know, sort of a, a good example of a, of a kind of data uh, resource that we can all work collectively to investigate um, and find better solutions for, for how to address this, uh, this terrible crisis in Massachusetts. So um, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to be on the panel. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I'll echo, I think that the chat is so energizing to hear all of the conversation there and see that this is not just something that the wonks in the room are excited about, but everyone has really in important insights. So I look forward to working with everyone on that. Um, so thank you all for making those connections to the research and your individual work, both on the ground in the community, and then also in your research and housing work at different levels. Um, so let's dig into the topics a little bit more. We uh, know that the research really highlighted those advantages that speculators are having as they acquire properties and operate in our market. I'm curious to hear more about this from Angie specifically. Can you maybe share uh, the benefits of why we should be uh, thinking about CDCs and how you invest in community differently whenever you're investing as opposed to speculators? And then maybe talk about some of the barriers that you faced when you're competing with speculators uh, to try to acquire new properties for the CDC. Sure. Thank you, Andrew, for the question. So when our organization buy a building, we are in it for the long haul. We are not interested in flipping. We are not interested in maximizing our return. But uh, our purpose is really to take the building off the market preserve it and stabilize the tenants. And if there's any small businesses um, in the building, we want to stabilize that too. Um, it is not easy. There are a lot of challenges going against um, uh, us uh, to preserve. Uh, there's, a, there's a term in the industry now called NOAAs, which is naturally occurring affordable housing. So that's the term that's been floating around the field for a couple of years. Um, so there is limited funding available out there um, as the public and quasi-public funding sources that we typically use to finance affordable housing um, uh, can't move as quickly um, as we would like, especially when competing against cash investors who say they can close in 30 days or less. The current affordable housing funding sources um, also tend to emphasize new construction 
So this type of preservation of privately owned uh, units um, don't really fit in um, with the existing funding priorities. The funding also uh, typically uh, comes with uh, strict income limits um, and requirements, but with occupied buildings where there are people living in them, oftentimes not all the residents will fit neatly uh, uh, with these income restrictions and fit with the requirements. So ACDC, um, we successfully uh, beat out uh, other investors um, in February of last year uh, to acquire 64 Beach Street um, in Chinatown, which is right next to the Chinatown Gate. So we were able to preserve um, the tenancy of the 14 apartments upstairs and a long-term uh, ground floor restaurant. We were able to do this because the seller was actually wor uh, willing to work with us, even though they had other investor offers. On the funding side, the city of Boston had ARPA funds to spend, um, so the timing was fortuitous. We also worked with an acquisition lender that was able to be very flexible and move really quickly. Now, the apartments had existing conditions that we all had to accommodate. Um, so there were two non-legal apartments. There were a couple of overcrowded apartments, locks and bedroom doors, um, people cooking with portable butane burners, um, you know, not exactly up to code, but this is what it took for us to buy this building and preserve it. Um, some thoughts for recommendations um, for uh, funders um, to be able to preserve more of this type of properties um, is possibly looking to establish some sort of flexible loan pool um, that can move very quickly to enable CDCs and nonprofits um, to compete against investors. Um, I do wanna point out that when I think about the payoff, um, it's more than just preserving um, one individual building um, because when a neighborhood loses enough of these buildings to investors, it really de destabilizes the whole community. Thanks, Angie. Um, I just want to underscore, I love that you started with the, the purpose of the long haul uh, behind CDCs. I think that that's really something that's hard to capture in research, but really important. We want to think about the long haul, kind of the longevity of our communities. So thank you for that and expanding on some of those barriers. Um, Katie, let's turn to you next. And I'm kind of curious, since you work a lot with tenants and renters, can you tell us what happens to them when an investor buys you know, a building that's currently occupied and how your organization helps tenants kind of navigate that process, find their voice and work within the rights that they have through that process. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, if an investor buys your apartment, they're going to do one of two things, hold on to it and operate it as your landlord, often raising rents by hundreds of dollars and likely displacing residents because we don't have rent control, or they're going to flip it to someone else and likely evict you in the process because we don't have just cause protections from evictions. So the rise in investors buying up our apartments is exactly why we need rent control and just cause protections. Um, just this year at City Life, we supported hundreds of households that got outrageous rent hikes and no fault evictions after an investor bought their apartment. Um, some of the strongest examples of how we've been able to um, organize with tenants and tenant associations and push back against investor activity um, have been uh, when we have organized against large rent increases and no fault evictions um, and through years of organizing and pressure on investor landlords, um, as well as pressure on local governments, we have been able to get buildings out of the speculative market to be permanently affordable and community controlled. Um, like Angie was talking about, um, a huge recent victory um, that we had is the East Boston Neighborhood Trust, where um, in partnership with East Boston the CDC and other local partners, we were able to get 114 units across 36 buildings that were all owned by one investor, Hodara, out of the speculative market um, to be permanently affordable. And this was the result of eight years of organizing across East Boston against this investor, as well as um, against other um, investors following a similar pattern. Um, and this investor alone had um, displaced over 100 working class Latino families from East Boston. Um, 
And at the same time, city life's organizing across Boston helped lead to the creation of the Acquisition Opportunities Program. And after eight years of organizing with community partners and a combination of public and other funding sources, we were able to get these buildings out of the market and even make it possible for displaced families to move back to East Boston. Another example was in Dorchester. We organized with residents of Six Humphreys Place, a rooming house, which was purchased by an investor who gave everyone no fault eviction notices. And after four years of organizing and legal defense, we worked with the um, Boston Neighborhood Community Land Trust for them to be able to purchase the building and keep long-term residents in their homes in community controlled, permanently affordable housing. So we really need laws like the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act in order to make it possible for more nonprofits to be able to stabilize residents in their homes at the point of sale and take housing out of the speculative market, as well as transfer fees and other public funds to make these purchases possible. We also frequently support tenant associations to organize for collective bargaining agreements with corporate landlords, which stabilize rents and buildings for several years. In Malden, I worked for several years with the United Properties Tenant Association, and um, through two years of organizing, we were able to get the corporate landlord United Properties to come to the table. And after six months of negotiations, we reached a strong collective bargaining agreement with 3% um, rent increases for five years in three buildings. But just a few months later, we were already having to organize again against $900 rent increases by that same landlord in other buildings in Malden. And so that really shows why we urgently need legislators to take action to lift the ban on rent control and pass tenant protections like TOPA to address the scale of this crisis in communities across Massachusetts. Thanks, Katie. Um, it's really nice to hear some positive stories and successes, but clearly a, an uphill battle and really difficult to keep um, housing stability at the forefront whenever we're having rent increases happening so frequently. Uh, let's turn to you, Brian. So you're doing a lot of research into this. Um, what are the structural conditions that you think allow speculators to so easily take advantage of the housing market that we have here? And why do you think communities of color are more impacted as your research is highlighted? And then you, you saw in our research, we're seeing the same trend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so historically, there are broadly, if, if we think of macroeconomic conditions, there are three market conditions that really, you know, fueled the corporate investment in single family rental housing market. The first one is ample supply of single family homes um, in the market coming out of the recession. Second, um, the tightened credit access for individual home buyers. Um, lastly, um, the decreased overhead cost due to high tech property management and purchasing strategies that these you know big corporations use and then as we as most of us know um you know in earlier like 2000 starting from 2008 these you know wall street investment firms big corporations have started purchasing a bulk of full closed homes and that's where they started and then once you do that you know in thinking about you know the property management property management you want to concentrate your portfolio in the in the same geography area. So I think um, I think especially and temporarily that kind of persistence has existed and has lasted over the decade. And why um, you know communities of color? Um, I mean there could be lots of re reasons, but I think one major reason is um, these are the neighborhoods where there are more starter type homes available. You know, the, 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 if you think about the price range, the range of price where the would be the first would be home buyers would want to shop their homes, and they are usually um, there is usually they are not in the exactly urban core because the the housing prices are a lot you know higher like in some market one as we saw, but in the surrounding areas like some market two, some market three or four or five, and um, you know. So that's, that's, I think, is the dominant factor for why these communities of color have been impacted. Um, I don't think these big corporations are specifically targeting, you know, minority home sellers, but the neighborhood conditions, um, you know, is, these are not necessarily in published neighborhoods. You know, the, the housing value is somehow, un, you know, undervalued, but, you know, um, they, 
they have greater, they have good commuting um, distance to the urban core. And then, you know, schools are generally fine. So the quality of schools are generally fine. So these are pretty attractive to, you know, um, 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 the potential, um, you know, renters for, you know, single family rental homes with higher price. Um, and, but, you know, the downside side is that, you know, I think there is effectively home equity laws that is triggered to the, the impacted communities, right? Home seller might be okay. I mean, they are rational actors. They sell the properties to corporate investors. They probably made a good deal, even at discounted price because of, of full cash offer, et cetera. But then the home, home ownership is lost as long as these properties are held by, um, are held by corporate investors and landlords. So I think that's really uh, concerning. And also, you know, one avenue of future research could be property tax appeals. In Georgia and in other states, many of these corporate investors are taking advantage of loosely designed you know, property, property tax appeal system. So they file appeal on appeal every year and the winning chance is pretty high. And they use consulting firms, tax representative firms, and then they pay less tax and when that happens, arguably, there could be shift of tax burden to other homeowners or even, you know, landlords. So I think there's, uh, there's another um, concern to local communities. That's great. Thanks, Brian. I love that everyone, I think, shared some solutions as part of their remarks. And so I think we'll be well set up for the next part of the discussion. Um, so Let's turn to you, Tim. Uh, you're going to talk about something that I'm really excited about, the Affordable Homes Act. Uh, so I'm curious, that's out now. We know that the governor and the lieutenant governor are really looking to address our state's housing crisis. I'm curious what your office is thinking about in this issue of speculative investment and how does the Affordable um, Homes Act try to address that? Or are there any other initiatives that you wanna highlight that we're, we're working on? Great. Thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, for folks who, if, if anyone's not aware, and I hope you all are, uh, the Affordable Homes Act is a bill filed by Governor Healy in late October. Um, it's about a, uh, about a $4 billion bond bill um, that's accompanied by about a little over two dozen policy sections that address a, a wide variety of issues. And I want to talk about sort of three different things that are in um, that are in that bill that I think relate to the issues we've talked about here today. The first is there is a um, there is a, uh, a policy section that would allow municipalities to uh, adopt a local option transfer fee of 0. 0.5 to two percent, um, which I think is a you know is a really important um, step to give municipalities the option to levy that fee if they want to. That's based on transactions in FY22. That's about equivalent to about five months of property tax for the average property that was that was sold and that would have been eligible for the tax. So if you think about that, if you hold a property for two years and now you're paying an extra five percent property, like five months of property tax, that's a fair bit. And so it can actually be a, a good disincentive to those quick flips. Um, or folks who are looking to turn property over very quickly, um, whereas a much, much less of an impact on um, uh, even for-profit entities that are looking for long-term holds and kind of stable rents and stable renters and, um, and that sort of thing. So the, and the, the other piece is that the transfer fee goes directly into the municipal coffers and can be used for um, a lot of the, you know, sort of innovative solutions we need for that. Rapid acquisition, like Angie was talking about, um, uh, you know, rental support, um, housing development, various things like that. So I think that's a really key piece of, of doing this is, you know, capturing some of that value from the sales and then reinvesting it directly into affordable housing in those communities. Um, the second is there's quite a few elements in the bond bill, both policy and um, and funding for home ownership opportunities, um, which includes, you know, supporting uh, folks who are developing uh, moderate income home ownership, as well as, you um, uh, as well as direct support, such as um, uh, um, uh, down payment assistance and other forms of support for uh, first-time home buyers, um, and it focused really in particular on on uh, home buyers of color. And I, those are really important things that can help, you know, provide folks with a little baby, a little bit more assistance to compete against um, investors when they're when they're trying to buy a home um, in their community. Um, and in particular, in some of the gateway cities, 
um, in the neighborhoods we've talked about where, you know, there are, you know, affordable opportunities that are still out there uh, for middle income home buyers. And, you know, there's a good shot at that if they can move quickly and, you know, have the resources ready. And I think, you know, the third is, that, you know, there's a lot of funding in there for affordable housing development and preservation. I think Angie's comments about the difficulty of, of acquiring existing naturally affordable housing are, are very well taken. But there's a, a lot of that money is set aside for trying to identify innovative solutions for how we, how can we, how can, what can we do here in terms of acquiring properties, um, in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, rehabbing things um, and and being able to move more quickly. And so I think there's, you know, that funding that's available and in particular the emphasis on innovative funding models. There's a, there's a, a social housing pilot um, that's identified for, for funding in the bill. So I think, you know, we're looking um, to invest not just in, you know, those traditional ways of of building and preserving, um, uh, you know, deed restricted affordable housing. But what are other ways that we can leverage state resources um, uh, through community partners um, and through municipalities to uh, to help build and and preserve those units? So um, those are those are a few of the things in there, and um, uh, we'll be um, certainly sharing more about all those in, in coming months, and hopefully the legislature will act soon. Thanks, Tim. I think that you um, clarify perfectly that this is going to take a lot of different tools. And I think the Affordable Homes Act has a lot of tools and strategies to help us uh, reach our housing goals. So thank you all. Uh, now it's time to turn to the, the funnest part, thinking about next steps and what are some possible solutions, policy interventions that we can think about. Uh, Jesse went over some of the recommendations in the report, but I'm curious to hear from you all. What are some policy or program interventions that could help our communities? Um, and we'll kind of go round robin if you can give maybe your, your top pick of what you think could be the most impactful policy uh, or program. And we'll start with you, Angie. Thanks. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, my top three picks would be rent stabilization, um, TOPA, um, and vacancy tax. Great. Thank you. Katie, what about you? Thanks. Um, it's important to frame this as a displacement crisis and that all solutions and policy recommendations need to center the people most impacted by the crisis, working class renters and communities of color. So my top three, um, one, we need rent, strong rent control, especially Homes for All Masses Bill, um, S-1299, H-2103, an act enabling cities and towns to stabilize rent and protect tenants and foreclosure prevention policies to immediately stabilize communities and prevent displacement of working class renters and homeowners. Two, we need the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act to take buildings that are for sale out of the speculative market to be permanently affordable and community controlled. And three, we need transfer fees to generate funding to make nonprofit purchases possi possible, like the East Boston Neighborhood Trust and um, Six Humphreys in Dorchester, for example. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian, what about you? Yeah, um, I I think the two big arguments um, in the police community right now for regarding regulating the you know the corporate investors is one, we should restrict the purchases, the number of purchases they do or the ownership. Second, rather than them, no, let's not regulate the purchasing activities, but let's hold them into higher standards. So there's two big con you know, contrasting competing arguments. And you know, um, in, over over the past year um, in the USA Congress, you know, at least three bills have been introduced to regulate big corporations in the single family rental housing market. So they the, those include, you know, um, Senate bill in, introduced by um, Ohio Senator Brown, Stop Predatory Investing Act, and um, House bill, Stop Wall Street Landlord Act of 2020, which was dead. At, the beginning of the year, interest by California Representative Kana, and lastly, um, another Senate bill named um, and Hedge Fund Control of America Homes Act, interest by um, Senator Merkley representing Oregon. So most of these bills, um, you know, suggest you know suggest that we should limit tax breaks to these corporations, meaning that we shouldn't allow them to deduct interest or insurance costs or depreciation of properties they have. Or we should um, we should put like tax penalty per home if they exceed 
if they have if their ownership exceeds like fifty properties. So these are kind of the the, the broad you know um, you know legislative approaches um, at the federal level. But um, you know I actually think those approaches could have very unintended um, side effects, meaning that you know, we should think about also the positive effect these corporations bring, corporate investors bring, which is you know, increased rental housing supply, right? So we can deny, we cannot deny that. And also it is very hard to distinguish or identify good corporate landlords from bad corporate landlords. That's very, very hard. And it doesn't really work. So, you know, I think a smarter approach would be holding them into higher standards. So for example, you know, considering local or state ordinances or incentives that improve transparency in property ownership, Right now, the city of Boston actually has a rental registry requirement, which is nice. The question is, how would you gonna use that ownership data, right? Um, and also, um, and also rental inspections. Thinking about proper property management. Right now, the city of Boston has rental inspection requirement, but it's done every five years for the selected properties. So I think a key particular question would be. How would you identify the corporate landlords which have been done by this report? And then how do they leverage that information for targeted code enforcement and rental inspections? I think um, rather than regulating the supply side, I think the management side would address the, would be a more long-term sustainable approach. Um, so that would be the, <laughs> my um, perspective, yes. That's great. I think that's good to think of it as holding them to a higher standard. And I think that ties back to what Katie and Angie were saying about just thinking about the people living there and how we can make sure that they're meeting their needs. Uh, Tim, what about you? Um, well, I guess if there were three policies, the top three policies, right? Is that the question? I would say probably upzoning, upzoning, and upzoning um, to be glib about it. Um, you know, listen, capital markets are going to, capital is going to flow. Um, and, you know, Brian made this point and investors are going to, you know, there's there's money that needs to, that wants to find its way into the housing market. And whether you like that or not, it's, you know, it's the world we're living in. The the problem here and the and the, the situation here is it's so hard to put money into new residential development because we've made it so difficult to build anything in Massachusetts. Mark made this point in the beginning and Luke has made it in the comments and others, I think so. And, you know, and and when you read, you know, investor um, reports from investor meetings and, and prospecti from, from real estate investment trusts, they say the place to go invest are those where you're seeing the, high, the most constrained supply and the highest growth. And so they are coming, the, the capital is flowing here because they say, well, there's no new supply. So if we buy up the existing, then we can, we've got everybody, you know, by the throat. And so um, if we can unlock the opportunity for more housing production, then we will see some of that capital flowing into new production, creating new opportunities for the residents who are moving here, the folks who are already here who can afford to move into those units. And then there's gonna be less pressure on the existing units we have. Are we gonna see rents go down? We probably won't, but like Minneapolis, we may see much slower rent growth than we've seen over the past 10 years. And I think that's, you know, to be frank, that's probably the best we can hope for. Um, but we really need to unlock the potential to, to build new homes and to make the, the reason why investors are going after the existing properties is they're scarce is, you know, housing, there's a housing scarcity. And in a state of housing abundance, it's a lot less, um, financially beneficial to um, to go and do that. So, um, you know, I think that's a that's a big part of what we're doing. I think you're seeing a lot of municipalities who are making great steps in that regard. You know, Brookline, in the way that they've um, responded to the uh, the MBTA Communities Act, I think is an excellent uh, example. And hopefully, you know, with partners like MAPC and 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 municipalities um, through that and a variety of other ways, we can we can bring more homes um, to the state and um, and meet the needs of the folks who are uh, who are here and all the folks who are coming. That's great. And I'm seeing a lot of love for zoning, zoning, zoning in the chat. So I think that's like the perfect way to end that. And as a planner, it speaks to me. Uh, so let's thank you all so much for participating and providing so many good insights and hope for where we can go from here. I think now we do have a few minutes to open it up. The chat has been so uh, 
helpful over this course of the, the time and it's been great. So we're gonna try to tackle as many questions, but I know we can't answer everyone's. Um, I think let's start maybe with the first question um, and this might be good for, for you, Angie. So someone asked how a speculative investment distinguished from investment. And maybe if you can speak to what is good investment, that was a, a question in the chat. And I think you kind of started to talk about this, but maybe if you have any other additional thoughts. Sure. I mean, um, having worked at ACDC for um, a decade now, um, it is really interesting to see um, the buildings that have been listed several times. I mean, I think about, you know, there's a half a block of buildings that um, back in 2015 or so, it was listed for $5 million. And we thought at the time that it was grossly overpriced guess what? It sold a couple of years later for over $11 million, right? So all of a sudden the $5 million seemed like it wasn't such a bad deal. Um, I think, and I want to tie this to um, zoning and the history of how Boston has permanent projects over the years. Um, one reason um, I firmly believe those things are tied is because um, we see that investors and developers regularly pay well over what the underlying zoning, the FAR and height limits um, justify um, uh, for those properties um, because they believe, um, I guess until at least very recently, that they can get projects permitted that are two, three times um, the allowable um, floor to area ratio and height limits uh, permits um, in Chinatown. Um, and because there's a precedent for that, there have been uh, luxury uh, high rises that have been built in and around Chinatown um, that are well over the um, allowable zoning. Um, and so it directly drives up um, speculation. Um, if we all stuck with um, the permitted zoning, um, maybe a building would be worth you know, um, a couple million dollars, but all of a sudden um, a developer is willing to pay uh, 10 or $15 million for it. Um, and that um, will set off um, the speculation. So that is um, what I think of as a difference between just regular investment versus um, speculate, speculation. Um, and it is interesting, I'm um, seeing the chat, some of the chatter about, um, you know, um, like we pointed out, like in a lot of um, low-income neighborhoods and that have suffered from long-term um, disinvestment, it, it is an investment good, right? Isn't that what we want? And I think about um, the example in Chinatown, we've actually um, you know, experienced both uh, ways of the pendulum. Um, back in the you know, 70s and 80s and even the very early 90s, um, the challenge was that there was a combat zone, Chinatown was seen as um, a seedy, unsafe, um, uh, underinvested area. Um, and the challenge was how to attract investment here. Um, when the combat zone got cleaned up, um, you know, the pendulum went the other way. So all of a sudden um, there was a lot of investment, but the challenge was the residents here, the low-income immigrants were not benefiting from those investments. And I think that's the challenge that so many low-income um, and BIPOC communities face is that when the investment comes in, it's rarely for their benefit. Yes, there may be some homeowners here and there who benefit on an um, individual basis, um, you know, from the sale of their homes, but overall as a community, it's often losing out. That's great. Thank you. And I think that ties back to what Brian was saying about a higher standard for investment and just having more expectations around investing in community and what that means. Um, do we have time for one more question, perhaps, Jesse? Perfect. Uh, so this might be a good one for maybe Brian or Tim. Um, someone asked what might be done to discourage investors from purchasing those one, two, and three family homes. Uh, could a type of restriction that would require owner occupancy be possible or a deed restriction or maybe other solutions? Tim, do you want to go first, Tim? Uh, no, you go first, Brian. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how do we prevent, you know, speculative investors from acquiring, you know, duplexes and triplexes? 
Um, I mean, logically, you know, um, if that's the goal, <laughs> then um, we could, with, you know, with a great quality of data on ownership, right, right? Not just number of purchases they have made, but the ownership um, in each tax, tax year, we could trace how many properties each entity has. Now with the advancement of data technology and AI and natural language processing tools, you know, back in the days, it would take years to, you know, trace all, every owner or every parcel in the city of Boston for like 10 years. But now, um, you know, with the algorithms, we could do it in a couple of days, even in a couple hours. Actually, my student at Georgia Tech in computer science and I have developed certain methodologies and algorithms. So with those data, you know, technology, I mean, we could trace how many, which entity has how many, and then, you know, at the either state or local level, you could um, put some restrictions such as, you know, or disincentives such as excise tax. If you own more than, let's say, you know, 50 properties in the state, and then, then whenever you sell or the properties, you would have to pay a certain amount of, you know, fees or tax, right? So that would be possible. Uh, that would be considerable, but, um, I think the a better approach would be, I think the very first step would be, you know, really improving the transparency and, you know, democratizing the data in ownership, right? So can, we should make a platform where it would allow every user can identify who owns what, how many properties, um, so that, um, you know, the civic organizations can actually, can do, can um, some monitoring, you know, activities or co-producing, you know, this kind of enforcement activities. So I think if, um, in the over in the long term, I think that would be a wiser approach, um, and not just leaving the authority to legislators and you know, uh, planners in the city and county, but you know, um, let um. Let us, you know, engage, involve nonprofit organizations with, you know, open data platform. Yeah, I think um, that would be the longer term approach, and that would really, you know, improve a lot. That would address a lot of other issues um, over the long run. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with with Brian. I mean, I think we don't know really know enough about this this question of like you know good versus bad here to to start you know regulating you know the ownership of those properties and and you know I think there's a lot of you know there's a lot of cases in which that might not be a bad thing. Focusing on the outcomes for tenants first, uh, for neighborhoods next, and then you know for you know. You know, for the for the investors themselves, I think would be would be the right approach, but we don't we don't know that. You know, we don't we can't, we're still not there yet. I think this is a this is a first step. You know, we're trying to reduce the regulation on, you know, sort of ownership and use of property as a way of achieving housing abundance. Um, so for example, you know, in the Affordable Homes Act. We do have accessory dwelling units um, as of right statewide, um, and uh, you know I think that's an important opportunity for for homeowners to be able to like have more flexible um, uh, use of their properties. In California, they did that a few years ago. I've seen a you know tremendous growth in casitas, but also now they've gone further to say, okay, well you can you don't have to live there, you know. And that's that is also part of our so you know, people, more flexibility in how folks are using property is, you know, and, you know, as long as we're looking at what are the outcomes for the folks who are there, is it safe? Is it affordable? Is it stable housing? That's really what we should focus on are those important outcomes, not just who's purchasing and how many other properties they own. But we need the information and the data, as Brian said, in order to really answer those questions. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all of the wonderful questions that were in the chat, but this has been such a great conversation. And thank you again to the panelists for participating. And we'll turn it back to Jesse. Thank you all so much for um, the wonderful discussion. Uh, thanks to the audience for all your great questions. Alexa and I have been doing our best to answer questions in the chat, but honestly, it's an overwhelming response. 
Um, also trying to split attention, listening to our uh, panelists' uh, excellent thoughts. So we will um, try to respond to any we miss. Um, we'll certainly have a record of the chat. Um, a reminder that we're gonna share the recording of this event and uh, we'll make uh, my slides available. Um, and thank you all again for your time and attention today. And this is really just the start of the conversation. Take care, everyone.